I'm going to continue on uh, and wrap this week. I want to start off very briefly with a poll. I asked you recently on the Stock Charts TV page, also through social media, is the next 25% move in Bitcoin higher or lower? And what's interesting is it was almost split 50 50. About 46% of you saying 25% higher, 54% of you saying 25% lower. Now, what's of course with Bitcoin, I probably should have made it 100% because the fluctuations are so dramatic. We might hit that over the weekend. We could hit a 25% move, if not in an hour, given the volatility that we've seen in the space. But the general implication was to, to see where people are leaning. I'm not surprised that, you know, asked that question. It's sort of a 50 50 split. It is, it is hard to get a read on. Uh, Bitcoin, I, I do not blame you for that. When we look at the chart of Bitcoin here in a little bit, though, I will tell you that Fibonacci retracements, tools like that that help you focus on key turning points or potential turning points, key support and resistance levels can be really valuable during a, a, a security or during a price action that's more volatile than normal. So we'll take a look at that together, see, what, see if that helps us out. Let's look quickly at what happened today, and then we'll take a look at the long-term trends through our wrap the week uh, segment. So as I mentioned, the S&P really gave back a lot just right at the end of the day. We'll sort of continue to process the closing ticks to see where we're at, but we're closing just above 4,200. Now it was up around 4,210, 4,215 for much of the afternoon. So a bit of a give back, but overall this week sort of fit the bill of uh, what the week before Memorial Day sort of looks like. And you know, in, in the last week, that's sort of what we've been talking about. It tends to be lighter volume, tends to be flat to positive. No huge movements tend to happen. It's about what we saw. I don't know if I don't know if this uh, week changed the game in any material way, uh, and it's easy to get caught up in the short-term rally that you saw this week. And I'd caution against that. Remember, the S and P's bumping against all-time highs. We haven't punched through them yet. Uh, a lot of growth stocks, the Ark Innovation Fund, Tesla, others are still pretty far off their all-time highs, and arguably more in a downtrend. If you look at the the trend in the highs and the lows, so a lot to be uh, a lot of performance to be played out before you can declare those sort of in all clear mode. Small caps and mid caps, by the way, essentially flat, but small caps, the weakest of the bunch, which is an interesting change from uh, you know uh, leading up to today, where you saw small caps continuing to, uh, to be in the leadership seat. Let's look at our wrap the week chart. This is what we usually look at on uh, Fridays, just to look at how the week has evolved. We'll refresh it very quickly here. I don't have labels on here, but I'll, I'll indicate through the, uh, the, the uh, mouse, if you follow what I'm, uh, what I'm looking at, I'll show you where each thing played out. The S&P basically up, 1.3% from last Friday on the 21st to where we closed uh, today. Gold was almost exactly in line with that same return uh, profile. And interesting, gold is often thought of as a safe haven. It is often thought of as an inflation hedge. So if, uh, if there are inflation fears, gold should be doing well. Gold overall has been, has been doing okay, right? It's been doing pretty well. A bit of a pullback here in the last week or two, but overall, the, the price structure, I would argue, is still very, very good, uh, and with a number of materials charts as well. And so overall, holding in line with the, with the market uh, favorable this week. What outperformed the S&P this week? Uh, we have uh, the NASDAQ 100 here, the Qs, up 2.1%. In purple, we have small caps up 2.6%. Continuing on, emerging markets up 3.2%. And the biggest gainer out of them all, crude oil up almost 4% this week. And what's interesting, if you look at the chart of crude oil, we're sort of testing that long-term resistance. If you look at the continuous contract, uh, it's had an incredible run, it's sort of up at the uh, upper end of that range, has not really followed through to the upside. And a lot of energy stocks have sort of pulled back after you know pretty solid runs to the upside. The question on my mind going into next week, we mentioned gold outperforming stocks, we mentioned crude oil outperforming stocks, commodities as a whole in a pretty good trend. But if paused a bit, I'm wondering if next week when we sort of get back to a normal pace if you see a reassertion of leadership from areas like energy and materials, that's a, an open question for me, because I think a lot of people are expecting the growth trade to just storm back next week. I'm not sure that's gonna happen. Underperforming uh, the S&P this week, we have uh, bond prices using the TLT uh, up 0.6%. Finally, flat for the week, the dollar, and the dollar overall has been on the decline in the last uh, couple of weeks. This is after a pretty meaningful bounce after a downtrend. Uh, so seeing it essentially flat and the worst of all these assets we're looking at is notable. We add Bitcoin to the mix. I usually take the cryptos out just because it's so much more volatile that it tends to compress the range of the rest of these. Here's Bitcoin down 3.6% for the week. We're going to start with the chart of Bitcoin here very quickly, and then I want to jump in just because I know it's not represented uh, in the uh, Mindful Investor Live chart list here. But when you're looking at the chart of Bitcoin, you know people have talked about when it when we bottomed out at 30,000 or when we bounced off of 30,000, I 
you know, went on Bloomberg television this day and I was asked, you know, whether we were going to regain all time highs essentially was the question I think a lot of people were speculating on. Like, OK, the bottom is in. We've gotten in there. We ride it higher. And I, I just don't see it that way. The way I've created the, or analyzed this chart is using these shaded areas based uh, loosely on some of the Fibonacci relationships. And this is a busy chart with a lot of lines. If you want to dig more into this, by the way, on my own YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior, I posted a video last week where we talked in particular about how we um, set up these levels, what the shaded areas really mean. But what I'm seeing, you know, taking a step back on a Friday afternoon is a chart that has transitioned from an accumulation phase to a distribution phase. I don't see anything but that. I don't see something that is clearly bottomed out and is bouncing higher. I see a, an asset that rotated lower, put in a lower high, put in a lower low. At that moment, when it breaks down through the first group of Fibonacci retracements after making a new swing high, I'm sorry, a lower high and a new swing low, that tells me by definition we're in a downtrend. And I'm, I'm assuming the path of least resistance is over. You combine that now with the fact that we've bounced off Another Fibonacci support level, also the lows from January. That's a pretty reasonable place for the price to uh, bounce. We've now rallied up to uh, the 200-day moving average, and now we're, we're rotating back down. We're testing 3,600 as or 36,000, excuse me, as we're recording this. So I see this as a breakdown of a key moving average, a, a, a bounce back higher to uh, to test it from below, and now starting to roll over a little bit. The RSI has gone from a bullish range down to a bearish range, right? In, in a bullish phase, the RSI tends to become overbought and bounce back and remain above 40. That's what you saw through, you know, a six month to even more period here in uh, the second half of 2020, early 2021. That has now all changed. You're becoming oversold when Bitcoin comes off. When it rallies up, you're testing resistance around 60. So all of those things together, I mean, my 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 analysis of this would tell you that the path of least resistance is lower. I'm not seeing enough to tell me that any sort of bottom is in. I'm seeing that there is more distribution to be had until you get some sign of accumulation, a higher low, some sort of validation, a bullish divergence, some indication that uh, that buyers are coming in and pushing it higher. And it's not just you know the dead cat bounce, which I would argue is what we're seeing more uh, now with the chart of Bitcoin. Well, I didn't mean to ramble on Bitcoin so much, but it's such a fascinating chart. And I'm struck by how many people, uh, you know, very quickly, uh, you know, have just talked about how there's clearly a lot of upside from here. And I and there may be over the long term. I have no doubt that, you know, the 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 theory behind Bitcoin and blockchain and all that. I'm I'm a huge believer in the long term implications. But as a technical analyst, I'm looking at the trend, and the trend is down. All right. To complete our wrap the week segment, we're going to look at the uh, Mindful Investor Live chart list. To get to this chart list, if you've never done it before, go to the articles tab on stock charts, go to my blog, which is called The Mindful Investor. There's a link right at the top to this chart list. You can look at these charts, save them to your own login, do whatever you like with them. First, we're going to look at the market trend model. Now, with the uh, the bit of the bounce, the bit of the rally, all of the action at the end of the day, our short-term model actually turned just back positive. It was just the tiniest, slightliest bit negative uh, last week. It turned uh, turned below zero last week. Uh, back up in the positive. And that's, again, given the, the, the strength of this week and the bounce, I totally understand that. The medium term model remains negative. And that's sort of my main risk on versus risk off model. That's telling me to be skeptical of the market going materially higher from here to think more about risk management than opportunistically looking for further upside. And that's pretty much how I would feel at this point. Again, I'm, I, I always am, am super uh, skeptical of a holiday week, which tends to be lighter volume and, and moving higher anyway. So this was not unusual relative to the normal script. I'm much more concerned with next week and whether you get a reassertion of the downtrend and, and further confirm the resistance that we're in, or we break to new highs, at which point I'll tell you it's uh, we're all in moving to, uh, to the upside. The long-term model obviously has been positive for quite a while. Looking at the daily chart, I mean, this is where we're at. We've rallied back up and, and at this point we've gone nowhere on a directional basis since the end of April, right? In four trading weeks, we've essentially uh, remained in the 4,200 to 4,250 range. Now that's with a four and a half percent correction during or pullback within that uh, trend. So granted that's a four and a half percent range, but overall we really have stopped the uptrend. The uptrend has paused and I would need to see us move above uh, the 4,225, 4,230, really get above 4,250 to signal uh, further upside, to, to signal a continuation of the uptrend. If and when we would pull back going into next week, I think this trend line taking the low from October and the low from March and connecting it to 
the lows in May a couple of times, I think is a, a very valid trend line. I think the fact that the 50 day moving average is right about at the same point, around 4115 right now, uh, I think is, uh, is, is a perfect line in the sand to manage potential downside risk. As long as we remain above that, I, I think we're in, in very, very good shape, even with a pullback uh, next week. But overall, again, the trend is positive until you start breaking these swing lows. We haven't done it. And the RSI broke, broke uh, you know, bounced off of 40, which is sort of a classic bull market behavior. Getting a bit into breadth, and then we'll touch on sentiment briefly. You know, when I'm looking at the breadth measures, my high-level synopsis would be overall very constructive. Uh, Jeff Hughes yesterday from JWH Investment Partners did a great job of describing the breadth conditions overall. Very, very supportive, and I have to agree with them. Today, oh, sorry, this is actually based on Thursday's close. The small cap advanced decline line made a new all-time high. The NYSE common stock only advanced decline line made a new all-time high. I would not be surprised if uh, large cap and mid caps would confirm that today after the close, we'll have to see. But uh, overall, the fact that this is being led by the small caps, again, for me in the back of my brain is thinking that tends to be more financials and industrials and some of those other underrepresented sectors in large caps that are a little more uh, widely represented in the small cap space. The fact that small caps are leading the way at this point speaks more to those cyclical parts of the uh, of the market. All right, so uh, we also can look at the new highs. You know, on an average day this week, about six, five or six percent of the S&P was making a new 52 week high, and that's good, I guess. Uh, but it's certainly nowhere near the level that you would normally see during a healthy bull market phase. If you are a believer in the raging bull market thesis, if you think stocks have a lot to go from here, you better be hoping that this line starts to go up and that you see more of a healthy amount, meaning 10, 15, 20 plus percent of the S&P making new 52 week highs on a given day. Uh, we've not been there. We've been more in the you know four or five, six percent range, um, and, and overall, that's kind of a, a market that's in a standstill. It's in a it's in a pause, which I would argue uh, we have been. About seventy five percent of the S and P, by the way, remain above their fifty day moving average. The S and P, of course, remains above it as well. If you would get a pullback, I would immediately bring up this chart. I don't look at it as much during a, a normal uptrend. I'm more concerned when we do pull back to see if we test the fifty percent level. It's worth noting we got nowhere near that, which for me, my initial reaction is we haven't had enough of a corrective pattern then. If we didn't get down to 50%, that's what usually happens during a garden variety pullback. We didn't get that far down. We talked about sentiment a little bit yesterday, so I don't want to talk too much about it, but AAII survey remaining sort of mildly bullish. The name exposure index bouncing back uh, up about uh, 25% to, uh, to be around 68% right now. And that's not overextended. That's not euphoric. That's sort of a healthy bull market phase. Uh, conditions. That's actually good. We'll have to be, this will be our last chart here for the weekly wrap, but I just wanted to point out when you look at offense versus defense, one of my favorite charts is within consumer. Are we, are we leaning into discretionary or staples? We pulled back to the low that we made in, uh, in late March and have bounced off of that. So the fact that we have not broken down to me tells us it is not full on risk off yet, but if and when we would get a further pullback in the S&P, this is a chart I would bring up to see if investors are rotating more to the defensive side of the ledger. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.